Interested in learning about wine, but not sure where to start? You're in the right place. Welcome to the Cork and Fizz Guide to Wine podcast. I'm your host, Haley Bullman, and I'm so glad you're here. I'm a wine enthusiast turned wine educator and founder of the Seattle-based wine tasting business, Cork and Fizz. It is my goal to build your confidence in wine by making it approachable and lots of fun. You can expect to learn everything from how to describe your favorite wine to what to pair with dinner tonight and so much more. Whether you're a casual wine sipper or a total cork dork like myself, this podcast is for you. So grab yourself a glass and let's dive in. Welcome back to the Cork and Fizz Guide to Wine podcast. I am so glad you're here. Today we are going to continue our mini series on France and French wine. So if you've been following along, you know that I just took an absolute dream trip to France and I wanted to tell you all about it. So in our previous two episodes of the solo episodes anyway, I talked about planning the trip, what that experience was like and gave all of my suggestions along with some fun wine spots in Paris. And then, of course, we talked about the first wine region we visited, which was Muscadé, and dove into that. Then we got to talk to a winemaker and his daughter, who is the manager at their winery, all about their Burgundy winery. And so now we're going to do a much more of a deep dive into the world of Burgundy wine. And I'm going to throw in this other region called Beaujolais that I got to visit while I was there as well, because I just, I couldn't not. I have to tell you about this. (laughs) So the plan is to start with a little intro into each of these wine regions. So we'll start with Beaujolais, and then I'll go into some details about my trip there and what I got to taste. And then we're going to do the same thing in Burgundy. And I'm going to try not to make this episode last forever, but there's so, so much to share. And I hope you enjoy it. Okay, starting off. So Beaujolais, like I said, I know we're going to go into basics of what it is, but the reason why I wanted to include it on this episode is because to get to Burgundy, my husband and I actually had to drive through Beaujolais. We ended up taking a flight from Nantes to Lyon, and Lyon is kind of the, it's it's really known as like the, uh, I'm trying to think of the fancy word, but it's like the food capital of France. It is very well known for its food but it is also the city that is closest to the wine region of Beaujolais. And so we flew into there, and then we got our rental car, and we were planning to drive up to Bone. And as I'm looking at the map, I realized we are going straight through Beaujolais wine country, and I would be insane not to stop in Beaujolais for a wine tasting. So luckily, I was able to book something And I'm going to tell you all about this tasting after I give you a little more details on the region itself, just to give you a little background information on the world of Beaujolais. So Beaujolais, I'm talking about it like it's a different part from Burgundy. And the thing is, it's actually the forgotten part of Burgundy. It's also known as the black sheep of Burgundy. So it is located south of the Burgundy wine region. And like I said, north of the food capital of France, Lyon. And this region actually used to be part of Burgundy until it was, there was some king, I'm sorry, I did not look up which king this was and when it was, but basically decided that this region was not similar enough to Burgundy. It was not as high tier as Burgundy was. And so it kind of got kicked out. It is still considered part of the region for some political situation. So you might often hear Beaujolais talked about as a part of Burgundy, but in the wine world, for the most part, it's kind of considered on its own now. In terms of grapes, we are talking about when we think of Beaujolais, there's one grape that I want for you to come to mind, and that is Gamay Noir, or Gamay for short. This grape is often compared to its more well known cousin, Pinot Noir, but I think it deserves a spotlight all on its own. It is incredibly floral and aromatic. This is definitely one of those that I would want a candle (laughs) that smells just like it. It has these really nice, bright, fruity flavors, really subtle, earthy notes. So it's just not just fruity. It's got this other, you know, it's not just one noted and it's incredibly food friendly and budget friendly, which like all of those sound perfect. In terms of common aromas in a gamay, you're going to get blackberry, raspberry, stewed strawberries, 
violet potting soil and wet leaves. I know that sounds crazy, but think aromas, right? You know the smell of wet leaves when you step outside. It's a fall day. The leaves have fallen from the tree. It just rained and that smell just overtakes you and you're like, ah, it's autumn. That's what a bottle of Gamay smells like. Structure-wise, this is going to be lighter body. So remember, body is the weight of the wine. So it just, it feels very light. It has higher acidity and lower alcohol. Also, very little tannins. Those tannins are the things that make your mouth feel dry. It's like it sucks all of the saliva out, like you have cotton balls in your mouth. So this has very low tannins. And all of those things combined mean, one, it's food-friendly, and two, it's a great chillable red wine. So if you're looking for something that is red, but you don't want something big and bold, you kind of want something a little on the lighter side, a Beaujolais or a Gamay is a great wine to do. And then if you do find a Beaujolais that is white, a white wine from Beaujolais, it is likely made from Chardonnay. Just a quick reminder, if you are not on my mailing list yet, what are you waiting for? I would love for you to join. When you do, you'll get a free shopping guide that has 15 of my favorite wines under $15. Head to corkandfizz.com, scroll down to the bottom, and there'll be a little section where you can join the mailing list. I send out a weekly newsletter filled with wine tips, recommendations, special offers, and so much more. Now, let's get back to the show. Okay, region-wise, Beaujolais is just about 34 miles long and 7 to 9 miles wide, so it's not very big. Much of the flavor and why Gamay is famous here in Beaujolais is because of the soil. There are basically two different types of soil. So in the north, you're going to find the granite and schist soil. And then in the south, there's going to be more clay-based soil. As I mentioned before, the grape to know in Beaujolais is Gamay. That's because it makes 75% of the world's Gamay. Last thing I want to talk about here in terms of just kind of giving you an intro to Beaujolais is that there are three levels of quality. And these are things that you're going to find on the wine bottle and kind of let you know what type of wine you are getting. So the very basic level is just Beaujolais. And when I say Beaujolais, you're probably like, but Haley, what does that look like on a wine bottle? I have no idea what you're saying. Beaujolais, it is a very French word. (laughs) It is spelled B-E-A-U-J-O-L-A-I-S. So it's like the start of beautiful but it ends in like Joleus. So uh, when you see it on the bottle, it looks like Beaujolais, but you say it Beaujolais. So again, your basic level is just going to say Beaujolais on the bottle. It's likely not even to say Gamay. It's just going to say Beaujolais. It means that the grapes came from anywhere in Beaujolais. Your next level up is going to be village. So Beaujolais village, which just looks like the English word village. And again, these will say village. They will say Beaujolais village. And this is just kind of the next level up. These grapes, they have to come from the village areas in Beaujolais, and they're known to have higher quality grapes, thus making a higher quality wine. The last level, the highest level, the top of our pyramid, these are called Beaujolais Cru, C-R-U. And some say that these have a similar taste and character to a red burgundy, but they can be found at a lot lower prices. The problem with Beaujolais Cru, they don't always say Beaujolais on them. These can be a little bit harder to tell what they are because they actually just put the name of the Cru. And there are, let me see, let me count, three, six, nine, ten, I think I have written there. I know they're either 10 or 11. There might be another one that was new recently. But there are a very small number. So I have 10 listed here, 10 Beaujolais Cru. And like I said, they're labeled by the name of the crew. So I'm going to list them here. Again, I don't speak in great French. I'm probably going to say these with a terrible English accent, but hopefully that also makes it easier for you to find them. You can also easily do a quick search on Google. And when you come across a bottle that you're not sure what that is or if it sounds familiar, You can just look up what is the biggest word on that bottle is usually the region, or in this case, it would be the crew. So the 10 crews that you could look for, Moulin Avent, that's the first one. I know it sounded like a couple of them. Moulin Avent. Then you have Morgon, which looks like Morgan, just M-O-R-G-O-N. Juliana, Bruy. And then there's a second one called Cote de Bruy. Apparently there's two of them. Um, It looks like Brulee. There's two L's at the end of it. Regni, Chenas. Chirobo, Flori, and Saint Amor. And again, these are all those high-level 
Beaujolais Cru. I think you can usually get a good bottle for about $25 to $30 of Beaujolais Cru. As you start going higher, again, you're probably going to get into that even higher quality style of wine, but you don't need to spend a lot to get a good bottle of Beaujolais. A couple bonus wines here, um, besides their typical just Gamay-based red wine, they're also famous for a style of wine called Beaujolais Nouveau. This is the wine that is made in the first couple months of the harvest season. It used to be something that they would make really quick while they were making all the other wines and what they would give to the harvest workers while they were finishing up making the other and harvesting all the other wines, but it became very popular outside of just the harvest workers. It became popular in France, then it became popular all across the world. And so this is a wine that like they literally harvested the grapes two months before. So I believe there's a Beaujolais Nouveau Day that is in November, I believe. And so that is when like that wine is made available across the world. They also make rosé here, usually Gamay based. And then there's also a wine that is called Coteau Bourgognon, and it is actually one that can be made from grapes anywhere in Burgundy or Beaujolais. And there aren't as many restrictions on what the wine has to be. And the benefit is it kind of looks a little bit like Burgundy when you're reading it. So it kind of gives the Beaujolais region, which is much lesser known, a little bit of that like name <laughs> recognition that Burgundy has. Now, to talk a little bit about my tasting experience, so we did a tour and tasting with the winemaker. We actually booked this tasting through a website called, and I, I can link it in the show notes for you, it's called Rue de Vignerons. And so I booked it, I'm pretty sure it was like 10 euro a person. That was it. It was like, it was meant to be an hour long experience. I think the winemaker spent at least two hours with us. So it was it was really, really special experience. And I was not expecting it to be the winemaker. Like we literally get to the door. It also looks like it's a place where somebody lives. And we knock on the door and he's like, oh, hi, I'm Jack and Jacques. But he said, Jack, I'm the winemaker here and I'm going to give you the tour. And I was like, oh, OK. All right. Great. <laughs> so the winery is called Domaine du Ton, T-A-N-E. And the name comes from the winemaker's wife's grandfather, whose name was Anton and whose nickname was Ton, so Domaine du Ton. The winery was constructed in the 1960s. And before the current winemaker, who we did the tour with, was the winemaker, his sister-in-law was the winemaker until she passed away from cancer in 2005. So he took over after that. It was really important to him that this stayed in the family. Before being a winemaker, he was a software engineer. His father, he told us a story that his father was a winemaker too, and he had to work as a child in the fields. And he's like, oh, I, at that point, I was like, I never wanted to do this as a career. And look where he ended up. <laughs> and now his nephew, which is the old, his sister-in-law's son, has started working the fields and wants to take over someday. And this winemaker is, of course, very much in favor. Jack here was is very much in favor of that. They are currently organic. I say currently because he does believe his nephew might choose to not be organic. And there are lots of reasons for that. One, it's really hard to be organic and make, make a profit all the time. So this year especially, so the 2024 harvest and growing season was really, really difficult because they had lots of rain. And so when you're organic, the way to prevent mildew is to try to spray with copper and sulfur. So you spray all of the grapevines with copper and sulfur. But the problem is, every time it rains, it washes it right off. They sprayed 19 times across the growing season, and it still wasn't enough. So this year, they won't have enough crop to make a profit. And I say this just to kind of point out, like, when you see bottles of wine that feel like they're really expensive or, like, you're like, why did the price go up so much this year? It could be something like this that they're dealing with. And it doesn't mean that this was like a bad vintage, like it's not going to taste good. It could taste absolutely amazing. It's more like what they called a difficult vintage or a hard vintage because it was really hard on the winemaker. Now, I'm not going to tell you about a winery and not tell you about the standouts of the wine that we tasted. We did end up buying a box, aka or a case, I suppose, um, which is 12 bottles of wine from this winery, both because they were amazing and because the bottles were like under 10 euro a piece. So we're like, absolutely, we got to jump on this. The first wine that we tried and the wine we absolutely fell in love with, my husband and I, uh, was their rosé. And it was specifically the 2023 because this one was a little different than the ones they've done in the past. It was darker because they picked at the end of the day. It was a hot day. 
and they left the wine in the press overnight. And they didn't do this on purpose. They didn't do it just because they got tired. The conveyor, which moves the grapes from the press into the fermentation tank, wasn't working. So (laughs) they were just like, "Eh, it's been a long day. We're done with this. Okay, we're just going to leave it there. We'll come back in the morning. And they came back in the morning. It was already that super dark color. And so what happened to this wine from staying in contact with the skins for so long? So normally a rosé, when you're making rosé, it's made with red grapes, sometimes some white, but you need some red in there. And you put the grape juice in contact with those red skins for a short amount of time. That's what gives it that kind of light pink instead of dark red. But if you leave it in there longer, you get a very dark very dark pink that almost looks like just a light red wine. And in terms of flavor, this wine was so round, super fruity, more tannic than what I've tasted, but in the best way. Like it just had this really nice structure to it. A couple other wines that we tasted, we had his 2022 Village. So remember that's that mid level of the pyramid. So we're above Beaujolais, but below the crew. This wine tasted like stewed strawberries, fresh herbs. It had nice round tannins. That's what I say when like you know there's tannin to it, but it just doesn't stand out too much. Like it's not overwhelming. It was really well balanced and just juicy. I think that word is a great word to use whenever you're describing Beaujolais. Like it's just juicy. (laughs) And then lastly, we had, well, we had many more, but the last one I have to talk about was a crew. This is one of the crew wines. This is the top level of the pyramid. It is the 2019 Brewy. Uh, This is B-R-O-U-I-L-L-Y. And I didn't write a lot of notes by this time. I was drinking lots of really great wine. But the two things I did say was it was very meaty and red fruited. So this is where you get away from that pure juicy kind of flavor. And if you like a wine that has a little bit more savoriness, a little something more unique, different to it, look for those crew wines because that's where you're going to find it. Domaine Duton and our friend Jack the winemaker is looking to export to the U.S. He does not currently, but he's very, very interested in that. So if you know somebody who could make that happen or you're looking for a really great Burgundy winery to start bringing into the U.S., please reach out to me or you can reach out directly to Domain Duton, but I'm happy I have his business card and contact information. I can connect you. I would love to see it happen because uh, we'd love to buy more than just the case of wine um, that we have coming our way. Okay, that's Beaujolais. Let's get into Burgundy now. So like I said, I'm going to give you a little bit of an intro to Burgundy. This is truly just a very, very, very basic intro. I don't want it to be overwhelming. The thing that you learn, and I'm sure you've learned from listening to our winemakers in the last two episodes, and you will learn in our other interview episode coming up in episode 80, 80, yes, it's episode 80, that the one thing you can know about Burgundy is there's always more to know about the region of Burgundy. The only thing simple about this region is that they only have four grapes. So the two most popular grapes that you will mostly know for Burgundy, the red wine is always made with Pinot Noir, or almost always, and the white wine is almost always made with Chardonnay. So like Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, those are the two grapes grown in Burgundy. That's where the easy stuff stops when it comes to Burgundy. (laughs) Because the thing is, there's actually four grapes allowed in Burgundy. We've already talked about one of the other ones. So Gamay is allowed in Burgundy, but only in specific situations. And you can't always, if you're going to label the bottle as Burgundy, it has to be Pinot Noir. But like I said, there are some versions. So like that Coteau Bourguignon. That is something that can have Pinot Noir and Gamay. Um, there's also a wine called Pastugron that I've tried before, which is also a blend of Pinot Noir and Gamay from the Burgundy region. But like I said, a red Burgundy, if it's labeled Burgundy AOC, it is a red wine. It will be Pinot Noir. Now, when we're talking white wine from Burgundy, like I said, it is almost always Chardonnay. The other white grape that is in Burgundy is called Aligote. And this wine um, used to, there used to not be a lot of it. It's actually kind of getting a resurgence. But generally, if you are going to try this, it's going to say Alagote on the bottle, except for there is one subregion within Burgundy that is labeled by the region. And you have to just know that it's made with Alagote rather than Chardonnay. And I will get to that. Don't worry. We'll, we'll talk about some of the Alagote that we tasted. Okay, so grapes. Two main grapes, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay. Two kind of sidekick sidekick grapes, Gamay and Aligote. Now, the other important thing that I think to know about Burgundy, well, we're going to talk about two important things. We're going to talk about classifications 
and then we're going to talk about the regions. And I and I have these separated out for a reason. So classification. This is similar to the Beaujolais classification. So I want you to think about this as like a pyramid where the bottom level is the most common or the most commonly found wine, the most budget friendly and just the least specific. And then as we go up, it's going to be the kind of higher end. Uh, there's fewer of it. It's less common, more expensive generally. So bottom, the very bottom level of our pyramid, there is just Burgundy or the regional wine. It is also called Bourgogne. Turns out Burgundy is actually just the English name for Bourgogne because there was once a traveler there, must have been a pretty famous traveler, and he couldn't say Bourgogne. And so he's like, let's just call this place Burgundy. Now we all call it Burgundy. So Bourgogne looks a heck of a lot like Burgundy. I'm sure you're going to recognize it. Or Bourgogne, yeah, I think that's how. <laughs> is that how Katie told me how to say it? <laughs> Sorry, Katie, I'm already forgetting. Uh, if you didn't get to listen to the episode, I believe this was episode 70. Uh, I'll drop it in the show notes for you. It was one of the ones previous to this. We had the wonderful French wine tutor come on the show and help with some of the pronunciation. And obviously, I've already forgotten some of it. It's so hard. Okay, got a little distracted. Back to the bottom of our pyramid. Classification, bottom level, Burgundy, Bourgogne, regional. This means that it was made with any grapes throughout the region of Burgundy. These are usually made with the lower level grapes, but you could put in the high level grapes in there too. You can do whatever you want. Well, not whatever you want. There are some rules, but basically grapes from wherever in Burgundy. Next level up. So we're moving up the pyramid. This podcast is sponsored by Repore Wine Savers. Listen, I love wine, but that doesn't mean I want to drink a full bottle every night. You see, it's always a risk opening a bottle knowing I'll only have a glass or two. But now I don't worry about that at all because I have Repore. These little contraptions will keep your open bottles of wine good for up to three months by removing oxygen from the bottle using fancy chemistry. And they're so easy to use. I simply open a bottle of wine, cork or screw cap, just like normal, and enjoy my glass or two. Then when I'm ready to call it a night, I rip the foil off my Repore wine saver and place it in the bottle in place of the cork or screw cap, and then stick the bottle in the fridge. Simple as that. Then whenever I grab another glass from that bottle in the future, I just make sure to put the Repore back on as soon as I'm done pouring. It's that easy. Want to give Repore a try? Head to Repore.com, R-E-P-O-U-R.com, and use code Cork and Fizz for 10% off your order. That's Repore, R-E-P-O-U-R.com, and use code Cork and Fizz. No spaces in that, and the and is spelled out. So it's C-O-R-K-A-N-D-F-I-C-C. -C. Once you have Repore, you'll never have to worry about opening a bottle of wine just for one glass. I mean, heck, now you can try two or more wines at the same time and have your own at-home wine tasting. This podcast is sponsored by the Cork Crew Virtual Wine Club. Interested in trying new wines, but not sure where to start? Or maybe you've been listening to this podcast for a while and you love the idea of tasting wine live with me. If that's you, come join my Cork Crew Virtual Wine Club and you'll get to sip wine with me twice a month while I help you find new favorite wines. The Cork Crew is not your ordinary wine club. This is a community of people who are passionate about exploring new flavors, learning about different wine styles, and having fun along the way. And the best part about this club? Purchasing the wine is completely optional. Plus, all events are recorded, and you have access to the full library of recordings as a Cork Crew member, so you can always catch up if you can't make it live. Oh, and did I mention it's virtual, which means you get to do all of this from the comfort of your sofa in your PJs. No need to worry about driving in crappy traffic, finding a designated driver, or spending an arm and a leg on a taxi. Want to give it a try without the commitment? You're in luck. Right now, I'm offering a free class pass to anybody who wants to try out the Court Crew Virtual Wine Tasting Club. With this pass, you'll be able to join a Court Crew event of your choosing. No strings attached. I don't need your credit card. I don't need you to sign up for anything. You'll be my guest. Simply head to corkandfizz.com slash free class pass to get your class pass and be one step closer to becoming a member of the best wine tasting club around, the Cork Crew. I can't wait to see you there. Now let's get back to the show. 
Next level up is village, just like Beaujolais. That makes it a little easier, right? This is where the grapes come from or come from vineyards within a certain village or commune in the region of Burgundy. So we're limited to where the grapes can come from. And so they're all going to kind of share a similar flavor, a similar terroir, you may say. And the name on these, so when you're looking at the bottle of wine, the label will say the name of the commune. Sometimes it also does say village, but not super common. More likely, it'll just say the name of the village. So like Mercury, that is a name of a village. In Burgundy, it'll just be called Mercury. And that's how you know it's a village. And then the next level up, now we're going up our pyramid, is a premier crew. These are going to be labeled by the name of the commune, just like the village, but they have to say premier crew or one ER crew. So that's how you tell the difference between these two. They might also say the name of the vineyard or just say the name of the vineyard. But again, to tell on the label, it does have to say premier crew. Now, again, these wines are our next level up. The grapes to make these wines have to come from vineyards that have been designated premier cru vineyards. This is an important thing to keep in mind that is not the wine itself necessarily that like has the designation premier cru. It does, but the reason it has that is because of the vineyards. The vineyards throughout Burgundy have been labeled as premier cru or we're going to talk about the highest level which is grand cru. It's basically saying that like these vineyards have been determined to have great potential of making wine. It's not to say every wine that is a premier crew is amazing. They should be, but there's also a lot of winemaking that has to happen. So just keep that in mind. These can come from a single premier crew vineyard, which in which case it'll actually say the name of the vineyard, or it can come from multiple premier crew vineyards around the same village, in which case it says the name of the village. Make sense? There are about 645 Premier Cru vineyards throughout Burgundy. Also keep in mind, I wanted to say here because when I was doing research, it took me a while to realize this. Vineyards are often referred to as Klima, C-L-I-M-A-T. It's not climate, has nothing to do with climate. It's another word for vineyards. If you see that at all, that's what that means. Okay, top level, the very top of our pyramid. These are Grand Cru. These are vineyards with the best potential in Burgundy. The wines that are labeled Grand Cru have to come from a single Grand Cru vineyard. There are no blends of vineyards here. They are labeled Grand Cru and they also have the name of the vineyard on them. There are just 33 Grand Cru vineyards, which is very small compared to the 645 Premier Cru vineyards. And Grand Cru wine make up just 1.5% of Burgundy wine. Okay, so just to review, bottom of the pyramid, Burgundy, regional. Next step, village. Next step, Premier Cru. And our very top is Grand Cru wines. A little bonus here. You might see this, and I just learned this on the trip. You might see wine labeled Hot, H-A-U-T-E, Cote de Bonne, or Hot Cote de Nuit. These are considered classifications that are between that regional and village. So between the bottom layer and the, the second to bottom layer. These are generally made with grapes that are located on the top of hills or on the opposite sides of hills that don't have like the, quite the right slope and quite the right sun exposure, but they're still pretty good quality wine. So something that was really interesting when we were in Burgundy, um, we got to do a tour where they took us up into one of the Grand Cru vineyards. And then we were looking over all of Burgundy and he pointed out, our guide pointed out to us that, okay, so do you see that this big road, this route that goes through Burgundy? And we're like, okay, yes, we can see this. And you can see this on a map. Okay. All of the vineyards on the opposite side of that road are essentially regional vineyards. They don't have any designation and it's on flat land. This is all flat land. Then when you come over on the other side of that road, that's where you're going to have the village, the village level vineyards. Then as you're coming up the hill, and this will also be at the very bottom of the hills, that's also where you're going to find the village. Towards the top of the hill, not all the way towards the top, but towards the top is where you're going to find Premier Cru. And then in the middle of a slope is generally where you find Grand Cru. Now, this is a super generalization. He pointed out many times when this did not follow that. 
But it just kind of explains to you why then we have another designation for vineyards that are at the top of the hill because that's not actually the very top is not the best place to be. You want to be in the middle of the slope. So the very top or on the opposite side of the slope where it gets a different sun exposure, those are going to be this kind of different tier, which is called hot Cote de Bonne or hot Cote de Nuit. Okay, that's your classification lesson. Now let's talk about the different regions. And again, like you already just heard that there are 645 vineyards that are considered Premier Cru. So I'm not going to go through this like vineyard by vineyard. I'm not even going to go through this like subregion by subregion. We're just going to talk about the main big regions in Burgundy um, just to kind of give you an idea on what to look for. So there are essentially four, five, four to five main regions in Burgundy. So the very first and I'm going to do these north to south. So if you are looking at a map, these are going to go north to south. So in the far north, not actually connected to the rest of Burgundy, is this region called Chablis. C-H-A-B-L-I-S. It is still part of Burgundy, but it is disconnected. It is just as close to Burgundy as it is to Champagne. Um, so again, we're talking pretty far north. This is where you're going to find that steely, acid-driven Chardonnay is that you might not even believe her Chardonnays. They sometimes taste more like Sauvignon Blanc and they are meant to pair with oysters and seafood and it's so, so good. Okay, moving down, you have the Cote d'Or. So this is C-O-T-E, D apostrophe O-R. This is the most expensive and most well-known region, but for a reason. The Cote d'Or, there are a lot of reasons, there are a lot of like beliefs on why it's called that. One of the reasons like Cote d'Or is that it has this really beautiful golden color in the fall after harvest. But the Cote d'Or is divided into two regions. So you have the Cote de Nuit in the north, and that is N-U-I-T, Cote de Nuit. And then in the south, you have the Cote de Bonne. For the most part, Cote de Nuit makes the most famous Pinot Noirs in the world. And in the Cote de Bonne, they make the most famous Chardonnays in the world. Now, you will find Pinot Noir in the Bonne. I'm trying to remember if there is Chardonnay in Nuit or not. But again, Cote de Nuit, mostly known for Pinot Noir. Cote de Bonne, best Chardonnays ever. Then, now we're moving out of the Cote d'Or. Moving further south, we have the Cote Chalonnay. This is an underrated and budget-friendly region. Two subregions within here that I did just want to call out quick. Buzeron, we're going to talk about this later. This is where that alagote, that like sidekick of Chardonnay, is found. And the wines here are white wines made with alagote. The other region I wanted to call out here is Mercury. I mentioned this earlier, and I'm also going to talk about it below as one of my favorite wines that we tasted at a Burgundy winery. Okay, and then the last region of Burgundy, if we're not counting Beaujolais, is the Macone, or Macon for short, M-A-C-O-N. This is the affordable, another affordable spot, often bigger styles of Chardonnay, and they only make Chardonnay here. So versus Cote Chalonnay is known for underrated and budget-friendly, both white and reds, Aligote, Chardonnay, and Pinot Noir. The Maconet just has Chardonnay. And it is also home to Poli Fusse, which is one of the well-known Burgundy regions, but for being like a little more budget-friendly, <laughs> not so insane on the wallet. Okay, let's talk about my experience in Burgundy and one of my tastings. So I'm just going to highlight one of the wineries. You already learned about Maison Shop in the previous episode. And if you didn't, go listen to those episodes. It is great. The winemaker and his daughter chat with us. They also own a winery in Virginia, believe it or not, which is pretty cool. But I'm just going to highlight this one winery because it's the one I took the most notes at. And it was the first of the day. So you have the freshest, freshest notes of all. <laughs> um, it is called Jean-Baptiste Jusame. The bottles have JB on them. So that's what's in my notes for the most part. But this winery, they actually purchased the home, the winemaker, Jean-Baptiste, which is what it's named after, purchased the home of his son's best friend, after selling his own domain and vineyard. So they did have a domain and vineyards in the family, but it didn't seem like it was working out. So they sold those and then decided to go back into it. So they purchased this home. It has a 14th century cellar, and they even ended up connecting the underground cellar to the neighbor's cellar after she sold her house or something like that worked out. So they have the whole underground area. They are primarily negociants, which means, if you remember from the previous episodes, from the Maison Shop interview, uh, negociants are folks who don't own vineyards. They purchase grapes. They can also purchase wine. 
or just grape juice from people who own grape vines and vineyards. These guys primarily purchase grapes and they've started buying more and more vineyards so that they can have their own. Now, while I did this tasting, before we talk about the wine specifically, I learned a few fun things. So I learned for one, wine can taste different based on the type of day it is on in the biodynamic calendar. So I know I've talked about biodynamics in previous episodes. This is kind of the idea that like your winery and the vineyard and all of it together is one single organism. And there's different cycles of the moon and different things that interact with the winery and with the grapevines that cause different things. And there's this biodynamic calendar where you have different days, root day, leaf day, flower day, and fruit day. And they just tell you what you're going to be doing. So like you would never... And I I think the idea is like you never cut the grapevines or prune them on a leaf day because that would be detrimental to them or something like that. But apparently it also affects the taste of the wine, which I think is very curious. And this is up to you if you want to believe this or not. But again, Burgundy is like the place that knows wine. So I kind of have to trust them. Um, They talked about a root day, which is what it was when we were tasting. The wine could be more closed off versus a leaf day where it's more herbal a flower day where it's more perfumed, and a fruit day where you get pretty much everything. (laughs) Other things that we learned, acidity blocks the flavor of wine. Because of this, we tasted the red wines before the whites. I remember when they brought out red and I was like, oh, they brought out red first. And I was like, oh, darn, no white wines. I love white burgundy. (laughs) And I was like, okay, it's fine. We'll just drink a lot of red wines. Well, no, then they brought us a second glass after we'd tasted some of the reds they're like now we're gonna do the whites and i was like oh what this never happens um but apparently the acidity in the white burgundy will block you from tasting a lot in the red burgundy so if you did the whites first the reds would just seem tannic interesting right and then in terms of what the wine will become this is always one of my big questions for winemakers i'm like how do you know what this wine is going to taste like in a few years or in 10 years or 20 years down the road They said, one, trust your nose. The nose will tell you what the wine will become. And the length of the finish on the wine tells you how long this wine can age. Okay, now for our few wine standouts. And like I said, I don't know if these guys export to the U.S., but definitely worth looking for. Um, But we had a 2022 Pomard Clos Baudet. So this was a village. I had like, I'm like quizzing myself on like what level this is. This is a village level wine. Um, it did not say Premier or Grand Cru, but it is labeled by the region Pomard or the village commune of Pomard. So this was located in the Côte de Bonne. This was a Pinot Noir. It had warmer cooked fruit autumn spice. The tannin was far more integrated, rounded, well-balanced. And the winemaker said this could easily do 10 to 20 years of aging. He also mentioned that a lot of times these different little communes or different subregions are known for having a certain flavor. And this wine tasted more like a different commune called Volnay than it did a Pomard. Interesting. Then we had a 2022 Premier Cru, Santenay Clos Rosso. And what I'm saying here, Clos, C-L-O-S, I'm pretty sure I'm saying a vineyard after it. And the Clos, C-L-O-S, tells you it's an enclosed vineyard. So there's like walls around it. This commune is the, so the Santene is the southernmost wine growing commune in the Cote de Bonne. So we're still in that Cote d'Or, Cote de Bonne, just above Chalonnet. I said this one was a Pinot Noir. I said this one was the sweetest, had like the smell of the sweetest of cherries, strawberry jam, deep red ruby color. And I mentioned there was just like so much depth on the flavor and a lot more body. It just had a lot of more oomph to it. Now, moving on to the whites, we had a 2022 Buzeron, which remember, Buzeron is the only subregion in Burgundy that the white wines are made with Alagote, not Chardonnay. This is located in the Chalonnais, which is that kind of like lesser known region further south. I noted flavors of golden apple, fresh bread, nuts, marzipan, lemon, herbs, and a floral note. I said it was really lovely. It was a tad herbal for me and not quite as round. But to be fair, I wrote those notes down when I thought it was a Chardonnay. I was like, hmm, this like isn't quite what I was expecting. And they're like, haha, it's because it's an Alagote. <laughs> and I was like, ah, that makes sense. And it had a lot more mineral notes to it. So fun fact, Alagote is often used in cocktails, believe it or not. 
Um, you can mix it with Cremant. Or we were talking to the winemaker and he and his wife got married somewhat recently and they used it instead of white rum in a mojito and they just added a little white pepper. I thought that was kind of fun. Okay. And the last wine to highlight here was a 2022 Saint-Aubin. This is located in the Côte de Bonne. This is a village level. So that village, that second level. And this was a Chardonnay. So this had nuts, cream, yellow apple, cinnamon, almond candy, almost this like burnt caramel, sweet lemon and pear notes. It was super rich, absolutely delicious. The alcohol wasn't noticeable at all. And it had this really nice like medium plus acidity to kind of balance out that richness. Needless to say, this one came home with us or is being shipped home to us now. <laughs> all right. I'll admit this probably should have been two episodes, but I think of these two regions as being sisters. So I thought it'd be fun to combine them. If you'd like me to dive deeper into either of the regions in a future episode, please let me know. There is so much more to learn. If you know a wine lover in your life that would enjoy this podcast, please share it with them. Find your favorite episode and send it their way or take a screenshot right now. Post it on social media. Let people know that there's some fun stuff to learn. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. I release new episodes every Wednesday. Next week's episode will be my last solo episode in my France and French wine mini trip series. We'll focus on the last wine region that I visited and the smallest, Jura. We'll learn more about a special wine that is made here under a layer of yeast in an old oak barrel and a spot that you have to visit it for the views, simply for the views. Not like Instagram views, I mean like beautiful landscape views <laughs> um, when you're in Jura. Thanks again for listening. And if you want to learn more about wine, come follow me at Cork and Fizz on Instagram. And if you're interested in exploring new wines, like perhaps maybe these Burgundy or Beaujolais wines, and joining an incredible community of wine lovers, be sure to sign up for my virtual tasting club, The Cork Crew. You can head to corkandfizz.com slash free class pass and come to your first tasting for free. Cheers!